Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the, to the today's three o'clock lecture. Um, it's a, these lectures, as you know, are um, optional, and, and so we get the, the opportunity to talk about subjects dear to our hearts, uh, not necessarily bullseye relevant to the, to the, the nitty-gritty of the course that you're undertaking. Um, and I want to take the opportunity today to talk to you about a few ideas to do with uh, language acquisition. <coughs> Mostly language ac acquisition by uh, young people, babies, people of the age of the uh, illustration. But why I think it might be uh, of interest, or one reason why it might be of interest to you, is because, like me and most of the rest of us, you have been working very hard to learn uh, a foreign language, one or more foreign languages, during your uh, adult life, or at least your later life. Um, and you might legitimately feel awed by the ease with which tiny infants acquire faultless language. Now, don't forget that we all start off as illiterate in life, and before we even begin to learn to read, we have acquired all the things that we, or most of what we need to manipulate our own native language. Uh, this goes for any human beings, regardless of education. If you, you, there, there are neglected children growing up on rubbish tips in São Paulo who speak uh, perfectly inflected Brazilian Portuguese. Um, this has got nothing to do with education. What it has got to do with is socialization. A child in isolation will not acquire language. They do need to have conversation, but that's all they need. They don't need any other sort of uh, stimulation at all, other than some sort of interaction with other human beings. So, um, the th this language, or what, whichever particular language it is that they're acquiring, is uh, a wonderfully baroque and peculiar thing. Which is why it makes it so difficult for us, when we start later in life, to actually get these things right. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, we've got loads of Spanish speakers here, for example. Um, would one of you just tell me the word for uh, the car in Spanish? Hmm? El coche. Mm -hmm. The car, C A R. Yeah. Coche, yeah. And what gender is it? Okay. Uh, French speaker? Yeah, what gender is it? So, why? <laughs> um, why um, are, our fem are, are French cars more feminine than Spanish cars? <laughs> what does the presence of, of gender add to the communicative effectiveness of the language? Nothing. Um, lots of languages have gender, and all languages have various peculiar systems which do not um, necessarily increase the communicative effectiveness of the language. For instance, Dutch, we have a Dutch speaker um, in, in one of my groups. Um, it, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to explain why, but there's two words that translate from on into Dutch, two different words. And they they both translate back into English as on, but they mean different things in Dutch, and they're to do with the method of attachment to the, the, of an object to the thing that it's attached to. So, when, if you're struggling with English prepositions, think how much worse it would be if you were learning Dutch. <laughs> so, all of these, all of these um, peculiarities of language, uh, and they apply not just as much to the sound system as they do to, to the grammatical system, have to be got right before you even start to learn to read. Um, and the rules are pretty baroque, but they are known intuitively to young language acquirers. Language acquirers know what a language should be like. They are expecting to hear a system which has got rules in it that they can derive from the input which they're listening to. Um, this is quite obvious when you look at some of the errors that they make. 
for an English-speaking infant, um, or sorry, not infant, in, an English-speaking toddler, you will hear them make the, the, these sorts of errors that are, that are displayed here. And you can see that the, the, the regular way of making the past tense in, in English is it, with, a, with a, a, a vowel sound at the end of the preceding word is to add something like a de. So play plus the past tense is played, and cry plus the past tense is cried. Now it's perfectly a legitimate hypothesis for a young person to come up with the, the version of the past tense I go because it's much more logical and much more expected than I went. Similarly, I see is much more logical and expected than I saw. Notice that when, they, when the children come out with um, versions of the words like this, inflected words that, that are, 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 are following a regular rule, that they can't possibly be working by imitation because people don't speak to them like that. The adults don't say to the children, I go or I seed, but the children will use these forms. It, they're evidently using a regular uh, rule which they haven't yet learned every exception to because the went form and the saw form are both in different ways um, exceptions to the rule. <clears throat> in fact, correcting children and telling them where they're going wrong has been proved to be less than helpful. There was an experiment which took place on children under three and a half years old, whereby uh, they were split into two groups and for a, for a short period of time, uh, I think it was two months period of time, uh, one set of children was interacting with uh, some adults who were giving it correction and the other set were interacting with adults who were giving the children conversation. For instance, if the child said, dog bark, <coughs> The correcting adult might say, yes, the dog is barking. The conversational adult would say, yes, he is, but he won't bite, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Now, after uh, this two months' time, some tests were carried out on the children. It was found that the ones who were having the correction were doing worse at utterance length than the ones that were just being spoken to. So that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the approach um, of making these rules explicit to the children, is, it doesn't do any good. They unconsciously know what they're supposed to be doing, and all they need is for you to give them the, 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 the input data so that they can, they can work on it and eventually get things right. <clears throat> Moving on to, 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 to some of the more surprising and early acquired um, aspects of the sound system of language that children get, it's been shown a long time ago now that newborns can understand the intonation, can appreciate that when they hear an intonation pattern, it is an intonation pattern from their native language. On English children, um, they, they, we're talking about four days old now, um, they were demonstrated to be able to tell uh, the spoken English from the spoken French by the intonation <coughs> pattern. Um, they couldn't, on the other hand, tell the spoken French from spoken Cantonese by the intonation pattern. Um, so that's quite surprising, considering they've, they've only been in the world for four days. Um, um, by one month of age, um, English-speaking babies have been also shown to be able to appreciate the difference between pat and bat. So that little voicing difference at the beginning of, uh, of, a, of a syllable was perceivable by uh, children at one month of age. Now this sounds um, surprising, I suppose, that in the least. Uh, and the first, the first of these findings is probably less surprising than the second, because the first of these findings <clears throat> only tells you that the child wants it's got ears and a brain and is in the, uh, still in the womb in the intrauterine fluid, can tune in to the low frequencies in its own mother's speech, because low frequencies is where intonation is carried. So being in the womb must be something like being under a swimming pool in terms of what you hear is a woo woo woo, woo <laughs> sound when, the, when, when your mother is speaking. So the fact that they could tell these uh, the intonation patterns when they were just four days old is, is, is not magic. It seems that they're just, they've are just they been listening to their mothers for some time already. The other finding is perhaps slightly more odd because the, the acoustic difference between pat and bat is very small. And so we'll return to that in a little bit a little bit later when we talk about some particular experiments. Um, before we move on to other findings, I should just briefly tell you something about 
the experimental method as to how we can find out that young babies can do these things. Well, one thing that babies can certainly do is suck, and they suck enthusiastically uh, at various times and less enthusiastically at others. So all you need to do to find out whether a baby is enthusiastic or not is to attach a pacifier or a dummy to its mouth, which is wired up to some sort of measuring device that can tell you the sucking rate. Now, if the baby is um, excited by something, by some, some change in the environment, it will suck faster. So the, the, the chart on the right here shows that the baby's got interested in something, and then the suck rate gradually goes down and down and down. What the experiment consists in is to change the sound of the baby's hearing at a particular time and see what happens. Now, if the baby's interested in the sound change, then it will do this thing, or this habituation, either it, 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 it gets left bored, and the sucking rate goes up, jumps up. If it's not interested in the sound change, then the sucking rate will continue to decline slowly. So that way, we can tell what's going on in the, in the or something of what's going on in the mind of a, a newborn. Moving on to slightly older children, uh, we find that children perceive the, um, trochaic pattern of, uh, which is typical of English uh, stress, by nine months of age, but not at six months of age. So we're, we're, we're talking with all these examples of a gradual increase in perceptual skills. There is a, a mirror image process also going on, which has been demonstrated by some other findings, one of which is that at six months, but not at nine months, English babies will distinguish ta from da and also from da. So they'll tell, the, with a slight retroflexion of the last sound, they'll be able to tell that slightly retroflex sound from the non-retroflex sound. Now, of course, da versus da is not um, phonemic in English. Um, but nonetheless, if the babies were going to learn one of the South Asian languages, like Hindi, they would need that phonemic distinction. <coughs> However, when they if they don't get to hear this in the speech round, their sensitivity to it gradually falls away. So by, by, what, by nine months of age, excuse me, uh, the English-speaking babies can't tell da from da, but the, the Hindu-speaking, the Hindi-speaking baby would be able to do so. Similarly, they seem to lose sensitivity to uh, or voicing contrast, the natural fricatives, which I believe is, is also uh, phonemic in Zulu. So that's something like kla versus kla, but don't rely on my Zulu accent, I wouldn't say. But um, I'd say that there is, there is that, that phonemic distinction in Zulu, not present in English. The babies can hear it at six months, they can't tell it at a year. And interestingly, also, it seems that Japanese babies don't have a problem with r and l at a very young age either. They gradually lose sensitivity to that as time goes on. So there's two different things happening. There's an acquisition of certain physical, sorry, certain psychological skills, and a gradual falling away, if you like, of this chocolate box of distinctions that the children have got to choose from. So it's it's not such a it's not a simple acquisition of of, of, of sensitivity story. It's it's a, it's a more complex one. Uh, different things are happening. Um, the same thing seems to be happening in the acquisition of vowels. This is a, a, a representation of an idea rather than a representation of uh, reality. This top diagram is a graph of two acoustic properties of vowels, um, all human vowels. All human vowels have um, a, a measure you can make of the first form and a measure of the second form. What that is, if you, if you haven't studied any acoustics, doesn't really matter for the idea behind this thinking. The idea is that we have this vowel space, similar to the one that we have on the, on the IPA chart, and within, within that vowel space, we actually can segment the, um, the different dimensions of, the two dimensions of, into areas within which prototypical vowels uh, reside. So we gradually tune in to the vowels that we hear around us, and as we do so, uh, we build prototypes of vowels. So this would be a prototype of, a, of an English set of vowels, uh, peripheral vowels. This would be a prototype of the vowels of Swedish. And this would be a prototype of five vowels of Japanese. And the idea is that as we, as we, as we develop these prototypes, as we become more and more 
desensitized to our native system, we actually lose the ability to distinguish the other borders, if you like, between these areas. So we've got just the same number of borders in our system as we need for, um, for our, the, our own native language. This explains why where I live, uh, which is in Greece, which has got a five vowel system like Spanish or Japanese, um, the Greek speakers who are trying to learn the, the bigger system, the large system of English, have a lot of trouble with our with our R, A, E, and distinction. So they've got it. They, if, if, if the words like cart, cat, and cut in English will all come out as, as something like cut, which is a, a, a low, which is the, the nearest Greek vowel form into all three. So this kind of gives you a, a, a feeling of, as to why it's or beginning of a thing as to why it gets so tough when you are older to develop things like a, a bigger vowel system because this, all this stuff goes in very early. All this stuff is, is starting to be developed very, very young indeed. Um, when the kids are getting a bit older, we can actually use a different method, which is what I used uh, during my PhD here which is known as the visually reinforced infant speech paradigm. Inf sorry, infant speech discrimination paradigm. The setup is kind of like a recording studio mm -hmm. with um, the, the control room here and the experimental room here. Um, and the infant, I here, sits on the parent looking forward and the experiment is in here with a computer and the assistant is here facing the child and mm -hmm. looking at amused with toys and things and making the child look forward. Mm. We have at the side of the room, we've got uh, a visual reinforcer, which can be anything that the child would be really, really interested in. I'll show you one in a minute. And we've got a loudspeaker. So those are the physical objects. Bear that in mind, I'll just show you uh, what, we, what, what we actually uh, do with the child. This is way back uh, when I was, this old photograph is way back when I was um, doing a few experiments myself. This is the visual reinforcer, which is at 45 degrees to the child. And what we want to observe in these experiments is when the child makes a head turn to look at the visual reinforcer. I wanted to show you this because you can see just how striking the 45 degree head turn is. If you're observing the child and it turns its head, you can't fail to, it's not like a random sort of looking around. It's whoa! And it looks to the, towards, the, towards the, the, the exciting, fluffy, drumming <coughs> penguin, which is what I have in the box. Oops, sorry. So, what do we do with this? Well, the, 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 once we've got this set up, the experiment has got two stages. We test children by playing them two sounds, which we know perfectly well that they can tell apart. Something like da and ki which are so phonetically different that there's no question that they can't tell and we already know that. And we, pre we play them the first one at roughly one second intervals through this loudspeaker, da, 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 not as fast as that, but that, that over and over again. Then suddenly we change to key. And just after we've changed to key, key, we turn the, we turn the, um, the, the, the lighted toy on. And the child goes, whoa, what's that? After a couple of <coughs> goes, after a couple of repeats of this procedure, uh, the child becomes, begins to expect that when the sound changes, it will be able to see the visual reinforcer. So you start to see the child, when you go from da to key, it's going, oh. Once you've got to that stage, you can then move from this, this onto a genuine testing stage, this from this, from this trial stage to a testing stage, where you start to play the child's sounds that you don't know if they can dis discriminate, such as pat and bat, for instance. Once you do that, the uh, parent and the voter, both, sorry, the, the assistant, both put, put on headphones. The experimenter is in a sound coming from anyway and can't hear what's going on in that room. And the computer takes over and starts to decide when or whether to change the sound. So the computer will decide at some stage to go from pat to bat or not. It's got to do it within a certain length of time. When it does, the child may or may not turn its head. 
Now, if, 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 we have, if we see the child turning its head, then we are, both the, the person in the booth and the assistant here have a button to press. And if they both press the button, the computer records a head turn. So then you've got a record of when the sound changed and when the child turned its head. And you can compare, these, are, these, are, these have got pretty good, uh, um, pretty good guards against, against operator interference. And then you can tell afterwards whether or not the, uh, the child is interested in the sound change or not, or can discriminate the sound change or not. Children inhabit a, a rather different um, world from us in many ways. This is a, a, a neural, just taken from a textbook. Um, this sort of very simple cell is, is typical of the, uh, the is typical of the cells which your brain is made of, and most of them are developed in about the first three months of your existence in the womb. But the cells themselves are not really the, 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 the activity, the, the, the presence of the cells does not make the brain active. What the cells do is to begin to communicate with each other via these long, strung out axons which have endings or synapses, like these ones here, where they can connect with, with the synapses from other cells. And that's where they exchange electrochemical information and it's that exchange of information that keeps the that, that makes the brain um, active. That's what's going on. That much we know. <clears throat> Something else that we know is that these synapses are formed in the in the first years of life, and then they begin to die away, not long after birth. And but while they're being formed, they're being formed at the well, I've had to read this three or four times at the rate of 1.8 million per second. So, I mean, it's, we're talking stars in the sky here. This is an enormous, enormous amount. Equally, when they start to die away in the first few years of life, they die away at, uh, at, a, at quite a rate. So you've lost about half of them by the time you become adolescent. So, just during that, the time when the child is acquiring its first language, is living in a cognitively completely different, well, physically, but with the physical brain, it's living in a completely different place. It's, it's got far all these, all these connections at its disposal to do things that we have no idea what it could possibly feel like. I mean, what's your first memory? How far does your memory go back? Age what? Four? Three? Mm. Perhaps. Four. But these memories are probably fairly, fairly, um, fairly hazy and probably very partial um, and, and quite disorganized, quite, quite unlike what's going on later on when we've started to connect concepts with each other and trying to make sense of the world around us. So the, 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 the baby's brain is, 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 a different kind of, is a different kind of machine to an adult brain in, in physically measurable ways. Obviously, in a, in a psychological way, it's, 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 it's in a different place too, because for, for one thing, it's not conscious. It's not self-reflective in the way that we are. I don't mean it's, it's unconscious, but what I mean to say is it's not got its consciousness organized via memory and via connected concepts in the way that we have later in life. So just at the time when it's getting, it's making all the big steps into acquiring its native language, it's in a different place completely from the place that we are all in. Which might make it less than surprising that our uh, efforts to learn a second language are completely different from our unremembered efforts to acquire our first language. It's not controversial in, for, for many um, aspects of psychological development that uh, there can be a, what's known as a critical period, which I'm sure you've probably heard of, which means that if you don't do something at the right time in life, you never get to do it. So there's an experiment uh, with kittens and visual input, which is quite different from, obviously, from language learning or language acquisition. <coughs> which shows that if you don't give, if you impoverish a kitten's visual input for a particular period of time, 
that it never recovers uh, its correct ability, its, its normal ability to perceive um, the, the visual environment. So this isn't this isn't peculiar to, to language at all. Um, some people will tell you that a child acquiring a language is very similar to a child growing from a small creature to a bigger one. That it's something that you can't stop. All you've got to do is put them in a normal environment, and and they'll do it. So it's it's not something we, in any sense, learn. So I usually try and avoid the term learning uh, when it comes to babies getting a language and avoid the term acquisition when it comes to adults getting a second language because I believe it's a very different procedure. Okay, let's go to have, have a look at some of this um, one of these little sets of ideas in a bit more detail. We talked earlier on about the, uh, the the fact that babies could distinguish English babies could distinguish bat from pat. Now you might well have known before you came here what the difference between bat and pat is, but I don't believe that you would have known the difference before you started learning about phonetics, because to anybody who's uh, naive, i.e., they've never bothered to learn about this stuff, it's not something they would necessarily introspect upon. Uh, we know perfectly well that uh, and you, you know all this stuff now. That, in fact, the only difference between pat and bat is what's going on in the vocal folds <coughs> at the onset of the consonant. So the, the uh, mouth and lips and the other articulator are in exactly the same position for bat and pat, um, but we are just doing something slightly different with our vocal folds. And that something slightly different is simple. Is Sorry, this is jumping around a bit. That's something slightly different is simply vibrating them or not vibrating them at a particular time. So here you've got a, a time description of the, the plosive where you've got a, um, an approach phase, so that's going to be, say, the vowel before the plosive, a hold phase, which is during the plosive, and a release phase, which is into the next vowel. So this is going, going to be uh, something like if we any kind of plosive, be a pa, a ta, a ba, a da, it's going to be a move from a vowel to a plosive to a vowel. <coughs> what we do with our vocal folds during the whole phase is vital to the voicing description of the of the uh, plosive itself. We can obviously we've got in theory we've got all kinds of times that we can start to vibrate our vocal folds. We can start to vibrate them when the, when the, when the plosive is still, is still closed. We can vibrate them just as it opens, or we can vibrate them sometime afterwards, or a long time afterwards. <coughs> so we can get various sorts of, if we just focus on bilabels, we can get various sorts of plosives like abba, abba, apa, apa. So you can do all kinds of different things by just delaying the onset of the vocal folds that have obviously got something to do with the voicing specification of the consonant. For the English pat and bat, we do something like open the, start the vocal folds going just about when we when we when we let the let the um, just about when we let the plosive be released for the so-called voiced guy. So that's this is this is something like bat. And we hold on to the uh, vocal fold vibration a bit longer so we get some aspiration in pat. Now there are languages that use this sort of uh, pre-voiced articulation, so bat, but we don't do that in English. So when, it, when an English speaker hears bat, they just think it's a slightly peculiar form of bat. They don't perceive it as phonemically any different at all. So having said, um, what we can do with the vocal folds, that we can, we can start them vibrating at any time, it's interesting to find out what we actually do do with the vocal folds. And what, how we manipulate them is so that our, our voice, um, our, our, our delay in, in, in starting the vocal folds corresponds to a certain perception boundary in the uh, listener's perception. So the delay in, 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 on, in the onset of vocal fold vibration is known as VOT, or voice onset time. And 
This little graph is a graph of some of these perceptions, actually my perception, that I think I did on my undergraduate course here, of um, what constitutes a voiced or voiceless consonant. So, zero here is the time at which the vocal, at which the plosive is released, zero POT. Minus 10 is, is 10 milliseconds before, and, and this is obvious how this scale pans out across the, across the screen. I was played synthetic tokens of um, a voiced, or of, a, of a bilabial consonant. I had to decide whether I heard a voiced one or a voiceless one. My responses were logged, and at a, anything that would have minus 10, 0, or 10, I would, I would give you the response, oh, this is a voiced, this is bad, as far as I'm concerned. Anything at this end of the spectrum, I'm going to tell you it's pap. The only time any confusion um, seems to come in is around here, and it's, it's, a, very, it's a very small period of the, of the uh, VOT spectrum uh, over which I decide to change my perception, or, or which my perception has changed for me. Now, <coughs> that is known as categor categorical perception because what I'm doing is I'm taking a scientifically arbitrary set of values and I'm deciding to put one of them into one category, voiced in this case, and another one into uh, another category. <coughs> Not all of the languages of the world do this in exactly the same place. In fact, there seems to be, broadly speaking, there seems to be two uh, categorical boundaries in the VOT continuum. One which is a, a approximately 25 or 30 milliseconds after release, and that seems to be the distinction that um, English, British English speakers make between the, the voice things which are all down here, and the voiceless things which are all down here, and another set of languages which seem to do the same sort of distinction but down around zero, um, zero milliseconds VOT. So that uh, this, the everything down here is voice, and everything up here is voiceless. So then again, this tells you why we have to talk um, quite a lot on this course about, you know, what sort of aspiration has your language got, and what sort of aspiration has mine got, and how do they differ? <coughs> These different categorical boundaries do seem to be pretty much, pretty much entrenched in, in people's uh, perception and production. This is another experiment which um, later on uh, we conducted here uh, on a, a bunch of uh, NA students who were taken to the phonetics lab, which used to be over the Euston Road, and asked to produce syllables. These are, these are, these are people who know all about voicing, vo voicing and voicelessness and voicelessness and all this. They've heard, they've heard all this. But we just asked them simply to, to produce voiced and voiceless tokens of the, um, of the three uh, sets of English plosives, that are, the, the purpose set, the tether set, and the cogo set. Um, that's the result, and there's a couple of odd ones, but not that many odd ones. And it just, what it shows you is that when they were producing these things, that as far as the, the Spanish, Italian, and French students were concerned, they produced the voiceless uh, consonants all above the line, but that's around zero uh, milliseconds, and the voiced ones below the line, around zero milliseconds. So they're producing things that ought to be categorically perceived by the interlocutors as, um, as tokens of one category or the other. In this respect, the, the Japanese, uh, the Japanese uh, speakers did a, a similar thing. But when we move on to look at the English speakers, and also we, we had some Cantonese speakers and a one single Persian speaker that year, we see that the whole thing is shifted up. That the, the categorical boundary is somewhere else. It's, it's higher up in the, in, the, in the spectrum. Now you can see that this has got nothing to do with geography, because we're talking about, um, we're talking about Japanese being similar to Italian in this respect, and English being similar to Cantonese in this respect. So it's just it's a, it's a routine that you you develop and use, but it doesn't have anything to do with etymology or the history of your language. It seems to it seems to roam uh, around the world independently of that.
So, going back to our children, what we had said, what had been shown, is that the English-speaking infants could do English categorical perception. They could tell a burp from a purr, given English tokens of those, of those consonants. This was a long, long time ago that this was, this was discovered, and people at the time got very interested in, in this finding because they thought, at last, we have got um, some innate linguistic skill that we can see. So nobody's taught these babies this stuff, but they, did, they just do it as part, of the, as part of their human language endowment. That was all very well and good for a while, but just a few years later, somebody else showed that not only did this creature, small creature, do this sort of perception, but so did this one. This is a chinchilla, and it was shown that chinchillas can tell bat from pat in the same way as babies. Um, I don't think the experiments were quite so gentle on the chinchilla, but um, nonetheless, that was, that was what was discovered. So, what's going on? I mean, obviously the chinchilla doesn't develop language, so can we even call this bad path categorical perception? Uh, you know, innate linguistic perception? Well, I think what we can, how we can explain this is to say that, yes, categorical perception is um, a sort of perceptual routine that is common to more than uh, the human mammal. Other mammals have this as well. But our early language acquisition allows us to change the settings, if you like, on the categorical perception so that we can uh, develop the, uh, the, the perceptions we need for our native language. So, I was just looking here for the the age of, I've forgotten the particular age at which they, they showed that there, there is a loss. It's going to be in the first year of life, similar to what I said about the Zulu uh, contrast and the Japanese contrast. There is um, some findings that show at an early stage in life that Spanish babies are perceiving uh, both of these boundaries quite regularly. So, if you like, there, they, there is a transitional stage. They, they, we, we start with the, with the, with the roughly plus 30 milliseconds of the OT categorical boundary, just like our chinchilla cousins. And then, in a, uh, in a, after a short time of, of swimming around in our own native language pool, we discover the, uh, whether or not our, our native language conforms to this, or whether we can shift the boundary somewhere else in the, in the, uh, in the spectrum. Now this makes um, a prediction, if we, if we believe that we've only got two categorical boundaries in the, in the BOT continuum, it makes um, a nice prediction that there ought to be languages somewhere that use both. So happily, we, there are. I mean, Thai is a language that's got three-way um, voicing contrast along these lines. It's got, a, it's got words that start with per, words that start with per, and words that start with ba. So, we are, our prediction is, is, is borne out in that way. So just a couple of little points to make to finish up. Um, <clears throat> production of sounds, we've talked about it a little bit. Perception of sounds, we've talked about it a little bit. One regular thing we'll notice is that in development, that production lags behind perception. Now this is partly because the, uh, the, the young human needs to get the motor skills organized in the same way that they need to get the psychology organized. You see babies waving their arms and legs around and trying to get themselves um, to make sense of what's going on. And they, they, tend, to, to, they tend to make um, speech productions in the same sort of way. They coo and gurgle and they they make a noise and see what happens. And so there seems to be a certain amount of organization going on. It's the, another factor is that, is that the, um, when a, a human is born, that the larynx isn't, the, the, the larynx isn't in the same place that it is when, when, they, when they've grown up a little bit. 
uh, it's in fact more like um, an adult chimpanzee than it's like an adult human, and it takes a while for us to get the, 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 the relative distance between the larynx and the other vocal organs so that we can actually manipulate the, the space, the internal space, using, using the equipment that we have at our disposal. Um, it, in many ways, the, the human uh, infant is an is a, is a, is a, a immature, physically immature. Um, two possible reasons, or two independent reasons. One is that um, we have this big head and we need to get that out through the, uh, through the, the mother's birth canal before it gets any bigger, for the sake of the mother. And the other one is that we really, our, 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 special, our special skill is our brain. It's making sense of the world around us. And we need to get going on that as soon as possible. We need to get out there and get the input to come in before we can, um, before we can do so. Very final point is to say that although language is generally specific to the um, modality of sound, it doesn't have to be. That with deaf children, you get exactly the same effect as you do with living children, as long as they get some conversation. There's a very nice set of, um, there's a very nice video about a set of uh, findings by woman called Judy Kegel, who went to Nicaragua <coughs> shortly after um, the revolution, when they were starting to put um, deaf children who had been isolated all over the country into one spot together so they could get some education. And you found that as soon as you've got a critical mass of deaf children so they could converse, that they started to develop sign language, not just not just not just little semiotic, you know, shouting for things or I mean, shouting with your hands for things, but um, actual language with grammar. Uh, so they developed their own independent sign language just because they came together. So we need to have our endowment, our, our genetic endowment to learn uh, to acquire a language. We have to have that in place, and when we get out into the world then we have to have the data to work on in order to get it right. But the whole process seems to be something quite different from what goes on for the second language learner. Okay, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Do you think it would help if you expose uh, babies to foreign language to help them learn from the language? In terms of uh, learning the language? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, no, I haven't met. I've been listening for so yeah. long. Yes, I've been mean, talked about sort of bilingualism, and you know, because there isn't really time to talk about that. But yes, I mean, any sort of language that you can that you can um, give to children, that they will use. They will, I mean, there's all sorts of social pressures that they feel under to to use certain languages in certain ways. Um, you find this with, with kids who've got parents of two different language backgrounds who both speak in a different language, that they will, they will think this is mummy's language and this is daddy's language. They don't necessarily think there's anybody else's language. Um, if they're, as I know, a couple of little kids who are grown up in London but they've got a Greek, a Greek mum and a Dutch dad, they, they could speak all three languages. But as far as they're concerned, now at this stage, now they're at school and everything, the English is the language that everybody uses. That's the language. You know, Dutch and, and Greek are these funny things that they talk to their grandparents in. I mean, later in life, I think, they'll, they'll, they'll realize what's, what they've got. But, you know, while they're actually developing, they, they're just getting on with it. I may have a little, little friend in Greece who who's, speaks to me in, in both languages. But I, if you say to a you know, if you say, well, what's, what's that in Greek, and you point to an object, she'll tell you, or English. But if you say, how do you say crab in Greek, or something like that, she has no clue. Because the, as far as she's concerned, these are, these are two different codes. And the, the idea that you can move from one to the other hasn't dawned on it yet. But I'm sure it will. And I, and I certainly don't think for a minute that you can confuse kids by giving them three, four different languages. Might slow down a bit, but they'll catch you all. Anything else? Well,
Well, thanks very much. <laughs>